over the next few decades, the metaverse will become immensely more advanced and integrated in our daily lives. Some people think the metaverse is just a hype. Others believe it to be the greatest evolution of the internet. Together with these sharpest minds in this space, we are going to explore the future of the metaverse. We want to understand the impacts of this new world. And in this show, we will find the answers. Welcome to Metaverse Mentors. Welcome at Metaverse Mentors. This is your host, Sami Badawi. And today I'm with someone who I think we are all going to learn a great deal from. I think there is two types of really great speakers. The first one has acquired the skill of great speaking by lots of training and practicing. And the second one has just simply been naturally gifted with the art of speaking. And I think that our guest today is the latter one. Our guest today is Martin Actors, AKA the profit growing innovator. Maat has been involved with solutions like AI and blockchain before most of us had heard about it. He's also been awarded by multiple tech awards and he's the former chief innovation officer at Legal and General, UK's number one pension and insurance manager. And he's the former vice president of IoT at Canonica. Besides his business endeavors, he has been an author on the book CEO 3.0, Driving Exponential Change. And he's also an advisor in Silicon Valley to a blockchain company. Currently, he's very active with developing decentralized solutions, developing and advising on tokenomics, NFT application, new industries. And with his strategic and thorough blockchain experience, I think Maat is the perfect person in the position to tell us what the metaverse has in store for businesses and professionals. So before we really dive into uh, what the metaverse is and the underlying concepts, I want to start with a bit of a different uh, question. As I've seen, you are the solver of Harry Potter problems. Can you please explain me a bit and walk, uh, talk us through what they are? Yes. So when I started working in insurance, where I couldn't be more different from the average uh, executive, I was talking to them like, where's your API and how are you going to like solve this and that uh, with what technology? And they would all look at me and say like, you speak another language. And I was like, yeah, I speak five languages, but I think my English is good enough. And uh, I found out that they just didn't know what an API was or they didn't really appreciate the value of an API. So if you talk to like non-technical people, the last thing you can do is use technology terms. So I then changed my uh, behavior and I said, what's your Harry Potter problem? And people go, my Harry Potter problem, what? And it's very simple. Any of those executives would have two types of problems. A very big problem that like they wanted to solve and knew exactly the solution for, they just didn't have the budget or the right people yet, but as soon as they had them, they know, go ahead and solve it. And I wasn't interested in that problem because there would be another type of problem where like they wouldn't actually know how to solve it. And as such, they wouldn't know who to give their budget to, but the problem was really, really important. So the only thing they could wish for was an innovator with a magic wand to make the problem go away. And that's a Harry Potter problem. So when they had a Harry Potter problem, they called me. Oh, wow. I can definitely imagine that there are also plenty of Harry Potter problems with regards uh, to the metaverse. And maybe that's also a good uh, segue because let, let's start with uh, the basics in as far as we can call it the basics, because definitely there is a couple of underlying concepts when we speak of this term, uh, the metaverse, or I also hear sometimes web uh, 3.0. From your view, what, can you explain to me what the metaverse is? in your perspective. Yes, so let's go back. The first generation of computers were like computers where you installed an application on. That was the first thing that we knew. The second generation were browsers where you would like run the application inside a browser, but it would run somewhere else uh, on a server. The third generation is the mobile app. 
So we are now in a world where like we run everything on our mobile. Now the next generation will be about us emerging into this next reality, us being part of that reality. And that can be because we put on goggles and we look around and we have an artificially created world around us. But it could also be because we use augmented reality where like things get projected in addition to the actual world we're seeing. Or even a third option would be we get some implant and automatically things get added or all of a sudden we speak a language we actually didn't know yesterday. So the metaverse is that emerging immersive world where we're no longer going to be looking like this, but we're going to be part of it. Now, that doesn't stop there. It, it basically is also a new economical system. And this is where like Web 2 and Web 3 will be fighting it out. Web 2 is like led by Facebook now called Meta because the way that they see the metaverse is like a big corporation gives you all these cool goggles you put them on and now you can go and buy things and guess who's going to sell them like hey let's create some artificial land and you can buy it through meta uh, so so you can clearly see that the meta version or the facebook version of the metaverse is a large corporation that like makes this happen and gets financially very well off by doing so. Now, Web3 is different. Web3 came about by people applying smart contracts to the financial world. And if they applied them identically, then they would have to get the same uh, licenses for banking, for payment and so on. So the SEC in the US came up with this thing that like, if it's really decentralized and we cannot find one company that if we say to shut down the system stops, then we're okay for you not to have a license. So Web3 was born in a way that like make a solution with tokens whereby there is no centralized company that makes money. So all these Web3 uh, Web companies are foundations. They make a protocol and on top of the protocol, there's a new market where you have buyers and sellers that make money. But the actual foundation doesn't get rich. The original founders stacked a couple of millions, hundreds of millions of tokens away. So once this market starts growing and the value of that token goes from zero to a hundred dollars, hey, if you have like 10 million of those tokens, all of a sudden you're a billionaire. So that's how the initial founders get rich, but afterwards they make it in such a way they can walk away. So why is that important? Well, Web3 plus Metaverse means it is not going to be a central entity that sells you the land. So the central land is a good example. It's a token economy where the participants on top do things and they create value, but not a centralized organization generating the land and selling it to you. And that's where I think Web3 plus metaverse is going to converge because it's an everybody that understand it can make money type of world instead of the web two world. Like, yeah, we offer it for free, but you're actually the product and we make money with your private data and we didn't tell you until we had to. So that's the difference. And that's why I'm excited that these technologies are coming together because the metaverse is like the sensors in the mobile phone and the screens in the mobile phone and your headsets. It's the AI that like uh, generates these worlds, the, the IoT 3D scanners that very quickly can like scan your house and now make it part of this decentralized uh, metaverse. The um, 
the the tokens from uh, the the decentralized blockchains coming. It's a, it's all these technologies coming together, and that's what's going to create the metaverse. Makes sense. Thank you for expressing uh, that so passionately. When looking at the movie uh, Ready Player One, I don't know if you've uh, seen that, but then you have this utopical virtual world, which almost even more attractive than uh, the physical uh, world. And you already mentioned Decentraland and there's plenty of others like Sandbox, Axie Infinity. How far do you think we are from this ideal state of the metaverse? Are we already in the metaverse or are we just at the doorstep uh, of this development? How far are we? Well, if you would, go back in time, you had second life. So you could say we already had our first version of, of some kind of metaverse years ago. You have Fortnite, you have like all the type of um, Minecraft and all these, uh, these type of like half immersive game plays uh, uh, and, and worlds where you can like add a dancing move to your character and buy that. So, so a lot of the things are there. But what happens when new technologies come along is there's a first generation and a second generation. And it's that second generation that actually becomes disruptive. Because the first generation is can we use the technology and translate something from the world we know into this new technology? but we don't change the rules, we don't change how things are applied. So for instance, when the internet came along, everybody was using it as a sort of like online newspaper. You would write and you'd publish it. And it would be like, you can come and visit my webpage as if you were coming to my newspaper. It was only afterwards when Web 2.0 came along that like, no, no, anybody can be a content creator. And we're going to change the way how you link with people because you can socially network a lot easier in this world than you can in the physical world. So you can see that Web 1 and Web 2 were completely different animals. And that's what's going to happen with the metaverse. I think we're seeing metaverse one. We will hopefully very soon see the birth of metaverse two, and it will be different than what we've ever experienced before. And this could be because there's some kind of new chip or whatever that gets implanted that makes us part of it, which wasn't possible before. There's new commercial models. Any of those things can provoke it. All right. And of course, no one can uh, look into uh, the future. But speaking of this second generation being unlocked, do you have a feeling on when uh, that probably uh, would be manifested? Is that uh, in a two to five year term? Or is that way too early looking at infrastructures, uh, what uh, companies uh, who are building the metaverse are currently doing? What's your take there? Yeah, I think it will be more five than two, because I think the next five years will be spent around like, hey, you, you will have portable devices that will use 5G, that will use the latest AI, that will use tokens and so on. So it will be first this foundational phase. Build everything together and improve it and, and create those first metaverses. But those will be still, let's copy um, the idea of the current world into this new world. Let's not really change it. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be closer to five, 10 years than it is to two years. Okay, I'm happy to uh, have a conversation in about five years to see uh, where uh, we are standing. And the professionals and companies listening to this podcast who aren't necessarily engaged yet with uh, the metaverse, as opposed to uh, Sandbox and the game uh, industry, but also uh, Microsoft and Facebook and the 
usual suspects. What can they do to capitalize or kind of start get started with leveraging this uh, paradigm shift that's taking place with uh, the metaverse? Where should you suggest that they would start? So with every new revolution, the early adopters are not the traditional companies. And the reason is very simple. If you have a working economy where you are the leader, why do you want to change the rules? You don't. You want them to continue because you're already the leader of the current economy. So you don't have an incentive to go and change the rules. But who has that incentive? The ones that with the current rules can't really get along. So, so if you look at, for instance, Bitcoin, who was using the first Bitcoins? It, were actually, it was actually criminals. Because I, they, wish I, I wish I was, but I wasn't. <laughs> so it, it was criminals. And I'm not saying go and look at what the criminals are doing in the metaverse, but you can easily see that like criminals, adult entertainment, um, things like general entertainment, they're the ones that like need to continuously adopt these new technologies because either people get bored of the previous ones and in games, that's the, the obvious thing. Like, yeah, last year was Fortnite, but this year we want something different. So people continuously need to look for new things. Or it's like, yeah, how do I buy a kilo of cocaine from a Colombian I've never met and I know he's a criminal? It's a hard problem and I can't use my visa card and I can't use. So, so what are the problems that people experience in this new world? And that's also where, like we previously talked uh, before the recording started about the Wortley maps and it's about that type of like if we map the world with this all new technologies capabilities and so on what's going to happen that will provoke a problem to people and can we solve or start about solving that problem today so what should companies look for what in this new world is going to be challenging can i create today or start today creating a solution for that because it always takes you some time to solve a problem. But too many companies go and ask a customer today, what's your problem today? And then use today's technology and then take a day. What happens? Tomorrow, they have a solution to yesterday's problem with yesterday's technology. And then they go like, hmm, strange that customers aren't lining up. But if you really want to be disruptive, if you understand the problem people will have tomorrow, if you use tomorrow's technology, you will be the only one tomorrow becomes today that has a today's solution for today's problem with today's technology. So that's how like really disruptive companies think. They're not going to ask you, do you want a robot taxi? They're going to think, hmm, if I could use AI in a car and sell you a subscription to pick you up, you could go to the pub and drink another beer because the car is just coming and picking you up. And we can have that same car be used by five other families. So we can divide the cost over six families. So I can do it at least two or three times cheaper than if you would own the car. It's this type of thinking that like makes the next big metaverse company emerge. They understand the problems that are coming and already provide the solution before other people understood why. And then the other thing they normally add is they make it impossible for competitors to come in. And how can you do that? Well, in the cloud world, for instance, I, I was working for Canonical and the way Ubuntu did it is let's make Ubuntu free as an operating system. And it in 18 months went from 0% market share to 75% market, uh, market share in 2010. It's quite annoying for the competitors. Yes, because all of a sudden you have a free solution that works. Of course you want to make money, but if 
in the previous world you had five servers and now you have 10,000 servers, you need a new software to manage 10,000 servers. So we could license you that solution. So if we provoke a problem, we can already build a solution for it. But because others uh, are still trying to sell you a license to their operating system, they can't really compete with you anymore. So the key to telling the future is understanding what problems will the metaverse provoke, what opportunities will it bring, and can I come up with a solution to a problem that tomorrow people will have and make it in such a way that nobody else can compete? Another strategy is uh, having a network effect. And this is what Amazon, for instance, used. Hey, if I have a bookstore, the more books, the more people will come to my bookstore. If I add other categories of products, they will come. And the more products I add, the cheaper I can get them to you, and the faster I can get them to you, the more you will come to my store. And there's only one that can have more books, cheaper, and uh, faster delivered. And that's a network effect. So, hey, you could open another online store, but you don't have the same network effect. So yeah. those are sort of the techniques that people use. I think there's a really uh, fundamental point that you're mentioning, and I can already imagine some of uh, the issues that will uh, emerge. Like we all have, will probably have a private wallets. So how will uh, retailers track or make sure their uh, co communication is geared towards the right person? Because nowadays you can track everyone uh, with cookies or their uh, yeah behaviors on the internet. But how are you going to do that when it's uh, just private wallets connected to avatars but also um yeah how can you unlock a awesome concert in a way that differentiates from uh, the competition that millions of people want to uh, engage with but i'm also interested in you hearing you what, what do you think the key challenges will be in this metaverse so one of the projects i just finished is about like uh helping user-generated content to be licensed better. So, so the problem this company, which is a Web 2.0 company has, is that they're already working with the most famous brands in the world, that when somebody publishes um, a picture of themselves with their favorite drink, the brand that makes that drink wants to use that picture and put it on a billboard or on the cover of a magazine. They can, and, right? Because there's no ownership for me to say you can't. Yes. So, so at the moment, they have this cool platform to, first of all, find them because you have this like um, haystack of like images being uploaded every day. And then they play fair and they say, can I use it? And then you go like, yes, of course, because I don't mind that like you, you use one of my pictures and you now put it everywhere. But... The second step of like, hey, you're very, very good at making podcasts. Can I use your previous one as okay? But like, can you make me five other podcasts uh, for free? You go like, yeah, but like for free is a little bit of a problem because you make billions and I need to live. So in this next world where like we're going to ask people to work by themselves because this whole concept of large companies where you go to the office, we, we've seen the problems with the pandemic. So we mm -hmm. need new ways that people can work in small groups or by themselves in very fluid type of companies. And all of this needs to come together and all of this needs to be made possible. So, so you licensing your work as an NFT, for instance, and being paid if that work is now shown on a billboard, but also if it's inside a game fee or a metaverse or whatever, is a great example of like, how do we make money? How do you make money? And how can a famous brand that is known for their drink in the real world transport and be part of that metaverse? So it's those type of basic things 
that like companies struggle with and and this is for instance one example of of like a solution we have to find for for a customer and i think you're mentioning also an accurate uh, point there with uh what you mentioned about fluid work because it sounds like these future companies will not be the traditional organizations like we know them today, but they will be something which is called for the ones who don't are who aren't familiar with it, DAOs. Can you maybe explain a little bit about those types of structures? And do you also think that they are the necessary types of structures uh, for this new evolution of the metaverse? Yeah, so so I have been an advisor to a project called Human Protocol, which was doing exactly that. Can we rethink the world of how people work? Can we have people, instead of at night opening an app to be entertained, open an app in the morning and the app would already know what you like and what you're good at and what you have like training in. And then it would just like a movie suggest, hey, you might be interested this morning to do these jobs. And you would then do those jobs. And in the afternoon, you traditionally like to do other jobs because you don't like to do the same thing the whole day. So it suggests you other things. So a future world is going to be a world where we don't have these like 100,000 people companies, but more like I'm good at doing certain things like making podcasts or whatever. Hey, in the morning, if somebody wants me to, to do a commercial or to, to uh, be a voiceover and in the afternoon to do an interview, just pay me for the minutes, hours or task you want me to do. Some sort and as a service. Happily doing that. And, and basically what will happen now is that if you are very good at it, you actually earn more money. Imagine a lawyer. I could go and work for a big buffet of lawyers and I could get my salary. Or if I have a bot asking you questions and once all the information is gathered, AI does a prediction and I'm just there to validate and say like, ooh, 99% of the time my AI is great, but that 1% of the time it's not so great because here this is going to be a lawsuit if we recommend you this. So I'm going to override the AI and so on. Well, all of a sudden that same lawyer could now do instead of like one client or two clients a day, 100 clients a day. 99 are done automatically and he just has to go like, yeah, approve. It sounds, it sound, Mark, it sounds like I should stop my job and uh, start tomorrow with this because there's a huge upside to it. But it also seems like at, simultaneously quite of a foreign concept. And I've already been reading a bit about those types of uh, structures and DAOs. But for people who aren't f necessarily familiar with it, how would you suggest they should acquire an understanding on yeah, undertaking this and pursuing uh, such endeavors that you are illustrating. There's only one thing that's going to be important in the future, which is being adaptable. Because if you think about it, if 20 years ago you designed stamps, all of a sudden they went away when email came. So you had to do something else. So, hey, you designed websites. All of a sudden, they went away because now it's virtual reality. You now learned how to make virtual reality. So the future is about, can you adapt quickly? Because it's not that we don't need new skills. We continuously need new skills and we need the creativity of humans. We need them to tell us it's like morally right. Uh, and all these type of things, which computers are terrible at. So, so, but like once a job is really repetitive, computers and robots will get better at it than humans. So do you want to be a worker of the future? Learn how to be very adaptive, learn how to like adapt your skills to what's the problem going to be tomorrow so that when tomorrow comes, you're one of the few experts. So that's, my advice to especially people starting their career or at the beginning of their career, don't think that you're going to retire here now because 
with technology evolution going so quickly, it's just not going to happen. Sounds like uh, a quote I can't remember of Einstein, but I will look it up uh, afterwards. But what do you think, think with this uh, constant change, the role of universities and traditional school systems uh, will be? Because now you can follow a bachelor degree for four years in economics, and then you can also do a master degree in finance for to become an accountant or an investment ban banker. But probably with the rapid pace that we are advancing now and the technology around us, these jobs are most likely maybe not existing or have transferred into other sorts of jobs. So what do you think about that? Yeah, so, well, if you think about it, in 2012, I wanted to learn about uh, AI. So I did uh, a machine learning cor course on Coursera. My wife is currently finishing her, her deep learning courses on Coursera. And I think the future is not Let's go to stuffy old building and have a professor in front of 300 people going over their book. It's about, let's help you learn new things on your pace, your speed with the exact help that you need for the problem that you want to become an expert in and earn money with tomorrow. So are you saying that students of today should go to Coursera or Udemy instead of following a three-year uh, course? Is that what you're saying? Or Well, it's good to go to university to get to the basics, but um, I'm not convinced that in 20 years' time, people will follow that same path. If we get more efficient ways of learning and teaching the next generation, then why would we stick to, to an old model, which again was built to create a financial controller or an accountant or whatever, which in a distributed ledger might not be as important anymore and we might need them to do something else. So this is exactly the type of thing where like adaptability is the key word. Interesting, very interesting. I guess what I want to talk about with you as well a bit is about uh, what you mentioned earlier already, NFTs. Can you first explain briefly for the ones that are not necessarily familiar with what NFTs are, what they are, and what the role of them, of yeah, of NFTs will be yes. in the metaverse? So let's look at Bitcoin. What's Bitcoin? It's a digital token uh, that people give value to. And the reason why uh, they give value is that you can't double spend it. You can't go and say like, let's make a copy of a Bitcoin and give the same Bitcoin to two people. And that's because there's a distributed ledger that as soon as I give my Bitcoin to person one, it gets registered. So when I give it to person two, they go like, you don't own it anymore. Now that is for tokens that are always the same. You don't differentiate between one Bitcoin and another one. But NFTs uses that same technology for unique or low volume type of tokens. So if you have a diamond and you can scan a thousand points on it and put that into an NFT, you could now virtually validate that that is the diamond and potentially even change ownership of the diamond. You put it somewhere in a vault and like whoever can bring the NFT has the right to get it out of the vault. So this is the way that NFTs are going to like transition um, traditional ownerships. And you can apply this to anything from houses to like documents, to regulations, to validations. Like, is there something that validates that my boiler has been cleaned? Well, Perhaps we should have an NFT because then an AI as well as a human can validate that my boiler was cleaned two months ago. So if the insurance ever has a problem, here is my NFT that proves that it was cleaned. So in a world where like tokenization is used, you can tokenize a lot of the things that today we would do with paper. And it would bring enormous cost and uh, benefits and efficiencies if we would do that. 
Can you explain briefly what uh, the differences are between to tokens and NFTs? Because sometimes they seem to be used interchangeably and feel kind of similar, especially with fractionalized NFTs as well. Yes. So, so all of them are tokens, but you have the, the fungible tokens where like, like a Bitcoin, one is the same as another one. And you have the non-fungible tokens, which is NFT. And basically, it means they're unique. And unique doesn't mean there's only one of them. It could be. So, so if you take the Mona Lisa and make an NFT that says whoever owns this NFT is the owner of the Mona Lisa, there's one. But what you could also do is you could take the plans for a new skyscraper and make that into NFT ownership and divide it into 100,000 NFTs mm -hmm. and basically start selling them. With the money you now collect, you can go to a builder, they can build the skyscraper and you would have 100,000 owners that can now go and say, like, hmm, I'm willing to sell my ownership to, to the new tenants or landlords of that building. So basically, it doesn't have to be a one-to-one. -one. You could have one building in 10,000 owners or 10,000 buildings and one token. But M makes the, sense. The, w the way that you are describing this, Matt, seems as to me that there is very high utility in NFTs. At the same time, I also see uh, incredibly valuable uh, collections like uh, board API club uh, crypto kitties and then a natural question which emerged from myself initially but also from others is why the hell would i pay more than a million in ethereum for a jpeg because they can copy it infinitely so do you rem do you, well? You're probably too young, but do you know what was the first million dollar website? Yeah, I think uh, I agree. I was too young. <laughs> yeah. So the first million dollar website was a website with um, one image that had, I believe, uh, a thousand pixels this way and a thousand pixels that way, and they were just allowing you to buy pixels on that image because there were a thousand pixels you could buy a pixel for a dollar you could now decide what part of that image was going to be yours and a lot of brands bought small things because everybody heard in the news there was a million dollar website so people would go look at the image and then they would find brands there what you're describing with the NFTs is nothing different than we've, what we've seen 20, 30 years ago. When a new technology comes along, people use it to do something they're already familiar with, which is how can I buy and sell art? Well, if I make it into an NFT, I can more easily buy and sell it because you now no longer can copy it because it is on a distributed ledger and just like Bitcoin, if you have my Bitcoin, you can't make it in two and double spend it. NFT is the same. So it's for the first time that like we can very quickly sell that artwork in seconds, 10 times. And everybody can know exactly who was the previous owner of the artwork and are they really the owner? So that's what the NFTs allow. But just like I explained before, Web 1 and Web 2 are different. NFT 1 and NFT 2 will be different because applying the same technology to a lot of problems from identity, from ownership, from certification, from licensing can all be done with NFTs. So you could come up with completely different marketplaces that change how things work and this is sort of like the type of projects I've been involved in. Really interesting. I, I sense that, that everything is, I don't know even if this is a real word, but any, anything is NFT 
anesthetable. Well, <laughs> it's any, any tokenizable or whatever. Um, <laughs> so yes, it is. What applications? Because I recently saw blocks be becoming NFTs. I saw uh, audiograms. Um, I, I saw so many different NFTs. What, what do you think will be big in 2022 in terms of NFTs, uh, like in some sort of new application or integration of NFTs? Well, anything that like people um, want to share and brag about if so it's you kind of a f online flex you're saying to say, show okay i am part of this uh, community and the uh, floor price is this and i minted it on time and i, I had the foresight to uh, invest in it yeah so, so look all these things are, are go with crazes so so what will happen is that like what was really really fashionable last year might lose interest Mm. Or might not, but like at a certain moment, people will lose interest. So, so it, it is possible that like people go like, "Oh, you remember those crazy days when people paid fortunes to own an NFT?" Just like people said you were crazy when you owned Pets.com, because who ever would like want to order their dog food online? Mm -hmm. So pets.com was once worth a lot of money. Webfan was worth a lot of money because who is, who is ever going to buy groceries online? But a lot of these things often, um, once they lose the immediate attention, actually become more valuable afterwards. Not in their current shape, mm -hmm. but because they solve a problem, but they were a little bit ahead of their time, People now apply them to new ways. And this is where you can see how Amazon took the web family idea. And now that we can deliver groceries quicker to people because we have a mobile phone, because we have all the fast internet everywhere, it now becomes viable to go and say next day delivery becomes today's delivery becomes an hour delivery. And with autonomous vehicles, it's going to be potentially minutes. So, so this is where like the future is going to be very simple, a faster, cheaper, better way of what we have today, because nobody will ever complain that like they're, they were given too much choice. Uh, it was too cheap and it was delivered too quickly. You mentioned Amazon. Uh, this made me think about something completely uh, a bit different from what you're you were describing. But why would I, as Amazon, if I am this centralized uh, organization with huge amount of capital, not acquire OpenSea or uh, Coinbase if I want to, uh, yeah, join the party and uh, become part of this new uh, evolution? Yes. Do you see this happen, or what's your yeah? How do you yes. See and, and again, history teaches a lot of lessons there. WhatsApp wasn't acquired by Vodafone or Telefonica or Nokia or Cisco or whatever. They all knew about it. They all knew because they all had it on their own mobile phone. Mm -hmm. But it was acquired by Facebook for a ridiculous amount of money back then. People were like, never, ever, ever going to make money with that. I think it was pretty cheap, to be fair. <laughs> now it is. And, and, and if you look at like what even was cheaper is like Android or YouTube, because Google acquired them. It yeah. wasn't Microsoft that acquired Android. It wasn't a television company or a Hollywood company that acquired Netflix or YouTube. And that's the problem. If you are big in a current setup and a technology comes along that like can disrupt your current economical model, 
you're not that fast in buying it. Because if you think about the telecom operators back then were making money for every SMS that was sent. Why would I spend billions on buying WhatsApp, which destroys my market? I don't want WhatsApp to grow very fast. So if there are new things to sell digital products where I don't need an intermediary, why would Amazon want to accelerate that world? Because they are the intermediary that makes money of that. Hmm. So it sounds kind of relieving. Uh, I'm uh, interested in seeing uh, how this will uh, unfold in uh, the future. Can you maybe tell us a bit, Maart, about uh, your own pre project that you succinctly already talked about that you're undertaking with regards to NFTs and DeFi and the metaverse? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm at the moment working for multiple um, innovative companies so, so this one is a web 2.0 company i can't unfortunately mention mm -hmm. unless you're uh, an investor and want to privately reach out to me then uh, i can put Stop you on the recording i'm out and <laughs> explore what the... <laughs> yeah but uh what basically it's about it's if i can uh quickly find that you are good at making recordings and i can license those recordings through an NFT and the type of licensing is that if I put them on like the radio, the television or in the metaverse, there are three different channels. So automatically I need to pay you three times because I use your uh, property to on different channels. So in a traditional world, that would be a lot of manual work. But in a fully automated world, that can be very efficiently done. So, so intuitive. <laughs> and yeah, I have so, thought about it. So can we make marketplaces where like great content providers and creators are basically put in contact with buyers that want to use it without needing an intermediary? I don't need you to go and put it on Facebook and make Facebook rich if you could immediately license it to some like sports drink or or some like uh, car company that wants to use it in their next campaign in some metaverse. So how can you all make this happen with NFTs? That's exactly the solution I have been defining for this customer and the tokenomics and the, the blockchain architecture and so on. So. So I help customers either from a financial perspective, look at like, how oh, do you can, like you are very good in this new technology, but you don't know how to make money or you're very good in making money, but now you want to use this uh, capability in a next technology. How do you do that? So let's say, Mart, I know you give uh, a lot of keynotes about uh, the cutting edge technologies for different people. Let's say you are very good at that and you want to monetize or distribute that among those different channels that you are describing, and one of which the metaverse. There's now, yeah, I don't know how many metaverses there are, but there are different metaverse worlds. How do you audit or do your due diligence as to where to go then? Uh, as uh, to, yeah, to, to, to distribute and offer your services. And that's again, the, the power of a decentralized world. If somebody now makes a connector to a decentralized world you've never heard of and sells your podcast or enables others to buy your podcast there, wouldn't you be willing to give them some small percentage because, hey, if they didn't do the work, you would never have like received the money. So think about it as gas fees, which, which is a concept in smart contracts. Because you enabled some contract to sell on a new metaverse your content, you pay a little bit of gas fees to enable that. And by doing so, you create this completely decentralized economy where specialists can work on very special things and each, if they bring value, get some part out of 
that whole thing. Because if I make a connection to this new metaverse and hundreds of thousands of things are sold, I don't need 5% per sale. I, hey, it was two weeks of work. I can do with like fractions of percentage, even fractions of fractions of percentage if enough things get sold to it. So this is a world where like specialists can work on building this whole economy instead of a centralized company planning it out and delivering it. I'm happy uh, that you're mentioning gas fees or I guess I'm not happy at all because I hate gas fees, but uh, this ties into a question uh, that I want to ask near uh, the end because a lot of people have this feeling that this entire revolution is also not necessarily very helpful to the environment. I know there is proof of work, there is proof, proof of stake, there is uh, yeah, immutable, there, there, there's, there's some things going on. But what would your response be to those uh, questions and uh, comments on the uh, harms on the environment? So, yes, too much electricity gets burned to mine bitcoins. That's exactly why it's a 1.0 technology. We didn't know how to do it better. We now have proof of stake and other ways of doing it better in which we don't need to destroy half the rainforest to generate energy. And hopefully uh, some of my next projects are now starting in the new year are looking at exactly that type of, is there, are there new commercial models in which people make money doing good, helping the environment to improve. Because it is one rule, which is if you can make money, people will try to do everything. Well, if you can just channel them and making the world better and improving our climate and get them to be paid for it, probably nobody will complain that much anymore about gas fees or about um, distributed ledgers or about tokens. Because if it improves the world, let's do more of it. Okay, for the listeners, this is a mountainous opportunity if you can solve this uh, problem. So pay attention uh, where you see uh, opportunities. So yeah, to, to dig a little bit deeper into that before the end, what do you think, Martin, will be the real world applications of the metaverse in helping improving uh, the world because personally i find that kind of important and also for uh, the next generation and i find it difficult not to imagine how this world is not only about fun immersion imagination cre boundless creativity but i also want to know how this will solve uh, our real world problems w what do you see there yeah so so don't think too Thinly around metaverse, think about widely. What if through, for instance, augmented reality, you could have people do things without them having to be trained in it? So what if somebody could be given a device that they put on their head or something, and all of a sudden, remotely, you could have them fix something that like they've never seen in their life so imagine that you have a solar park in the middle of the sahara desert and somebody could just put on some helmet and open up a very complex steering mechanism and fix something remotely because you can project step by step what they have to do and somebody can remotely help them if they run into trouble. So it is those type of things that I think will come sooner than like a virtual rainforest, because the virtual rainforest might not generate oxygen. It might be a virtual rainforest where if you buy a virtual tree, a real tree gets planted and you get the NFT for it. That could be a good one. And it could also be other things, but like you shouldn't be too much focused on like one technology and another technology, and another technology. You should more think holistically. holistically. What are the things that like together can really fix the problem? Focus on the 
problems, not on the technology. You don't want to have a thousand solutions for five paying customer problems. You want to find that one technology that can solve five million paying customer problems. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's the type that's of thing that makes you rich. Yeah. Yes, and unfortunately, that's not very easy either, but otherwise everyone uh, would do it. Mato, what is something, uh, I think it's also a very powerful statement that you uh, just made. Don't think too narrowly, but think holistically about the convergence and the possibilities of different technologies, not in a skewed way, only about the metaverse. So that's already a wonderful close-off message. But do you maybe have a message for the, audi uh, for the audience or the listeners with regards to this entire transition uh, that seems to be uh, taking uh, place? Yes, I, I have a very, very simple rule in life. I have three kids and like anything I do, I want them to find the world in a better place than I found it myself. So whatever you do, should be helping you getting closer to that. If it gets you very far away and you see that you're working on something that like, really like, yeah, you might be paid a lot of money, but it actually is doing the opposite. Perhaps it's time for a change because you might make a lot of money, but you will not feel very good sitting alone on your private island with your oxygen mask uh, to be able to breathe. So, so try to make this world better than you found it. And even if it's just slightly, you can be happy because you did something valuable. So what, what a conversation. It almost felt, didn't feel like a conversation. It almost felt like I went back to university to a lecture from a uh, economics or technology professor uh, in a sense. I could really sense that Matt had a lot of uh, strategic experience with regards to applying and implementing new technologies to disrupt uh, the status quo. And I feel what he is doing uh, every time and yeah, over the course of different years is identifying problems before they emerge and also thinking and developing solutions for those uh, problems and then monetizing uh, that and yeah that approach and the wardly maps for example that he mentioned to do precisely that identifying problems before they emerge and developing solutions for that to be able to monetize them that's something i really uh, took away from this podcast it was also really interesting to hear his uh, perspective on what tokenization is what the role of NFTs uh, are and of big uh, corporates, because while these concepts become increasingly more apparent with every podcast, it still is interesting and educational for me personally to hear those interpretations from uh, different uh, guests. And uh, yeah, altogether, it had been a fun uh, educational lecture, I would uh, say. Do you agree with this or disagree and have a fundamentally different opinion or view on the things that have been shared in the podcast? Then please uh, put it in the comments. I'm reading uh, every uh, and each one of them. Um, did you find it actually interesting or educational? Then uh, please subscribe at the button below on the subscribe button and then I will do my best to deliver something interesting on the next uh, podcast with our, with our next interesting uh, guest.